From Greece to migration, European decision-making is an accumulation of historical mistakes. The incapacity to construct a real transnational democracy is jeopardizing the well-being of all peoples of Europe. European Alternatives is a transnational citizens movement promoting ideals of democracy, equality and culture beyond the nation-state. But are these ideals still compatible with what Europe has become today? We asked this question in Lisbon at a European meeting of activists organized by European Alternatives. And we discussed this question with some of the key people behind European Alternatives. Nicolò Milanese, philosopher, poet and one of the founders of the organization. Ségolène Prouveau, urbanist and director of the office in Paris. Daphne Bülesbach, director of the office in Berlin. And Beppe Caccia, former councillor in the city of Venice and member of the board of trustees of European Alternatives. Welcome to Talk Real. The preamble of the American Constitution begins with we, the people. The preamble to the European Constitution that was sunk by the French and Dutch referendum in 2005 began with we, the kings, the queens, and the presidents of Europe. The oligarchical risk of the European Union has never been clearer than today. Six months of negotiations uh, with Greece have made one thing very clear the governance structures of the Eurozone are broken. The question I want to begin with today, the provocation I want to start from, is whether we think that European alternatives are still possible today, whether we can still call ourselves pro-European and defendants of ideals of democracy, of justice, of solidarity. Nicola, let's begin with you. Okay, well, I think that at a simple and abstract level, alternatives have to be possible. Otherwise, we absolve uh, not only all the leaders, but the citizens of any responsibility for their uh, decisions. We have to be able to say they could decide otherwise, things could be otherwise. Then the more difficult question is uh, that the situation can seem pretty hopeless. But uh, two things give me uh, some hope that European alternatives are possible. One is that six, seven years after this financial crisis uh, came to Europe, now uh, it's clear in everybody's minds that um, it can only be dealt with at a European level. That wasn't the case uh, at the beginning of the crisis. People were still in a certain sense of shock. Now our eyes have been opened. And I think that's a, a realistic level to try to uh, fight for alternatives on. Uh, the second thing that gives me hope is that um, the technocratic forces are now being so brazen um, in their attack on democracy that in fact I think they realize they're in a position of fragility. Uh, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's a classic, uh, when, you're, when you're backed in a corner you have to attack as hard as you can because they know they have no moral justification. Uh, and they know that it's becoming more and more transparent to people that they have no moral justification. And so they're trying with the force of their, of their uh, tone of voice, it's not even arguments, it's their tone of voice um, to, to back people away from them. And I take that as a sign of their fragility. Definitely. Well, I would say I, I don't think it's possible to imagine um, a Europe without alternatives. But what I'm sure about, or what at least maybe gave a lot of people hope, is that, you know, I think the democratic, um, refer the, 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 the referendum that we had in Greece um, showed that you know there is a, there is a whole nation that stood up against a system that they don't agree with, and uh, and I think that that sends a message of hope. Whether whatever the outcome of, of this situation is, I think it shows that there is a country that doesn't agree, and there's a lot of people that don't agree, and I think there's a lot of people that showed solidarity with you know that message of no, and um, which is an alternative to to the, to the system. And I think kind of going back, I mean, I'm not sure if I if I agree that. Uh, our leaders are seeing um, the fragility of, of the system and you know kind of realizing that a lack of transparency is something that they need to address but 
I, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I do believe is that um, you know, the Europe that is founded on this, this, you know, this normative approach that you know, it's founded on democracy and egalitarian solidarity, I think is something that, that um, most, most of us agree and it's a non-partisan issue. And that maybe is something that can give us hope that based on these norms and values that Europe is founded on, you know, we might re-establish alternatives, new alternatives, new approaches. Uh, I come uh, from, uh, personally, from a German school. The school uh, of a poet uh, named uh, Friedrich Hölderlin, which uh, said, uh, where danger threatens, salvation also grows. And what does it mean to keep salvation growing here and now in Europe? It means to avoid the suicide of Europe. There are two ways by which Europe could commit suicide. First, smothered by technocratic cage of strict financial policies. The austerity regime we experienced in the last five years. Second, splitting, divided by populistic nationalism. And in this moment, the most dangerous nationalism the most dangerous populism is that of the forces ruling uh, the Große Coalition government in Germany. They are not defending Europe from uh, the growth of nationalistic populism. They are implementing, but in the same time, with their appeal, with their call to the people, are also revealing that uh, we are in front of a clear question of uh, power relationship. And more and more people all around Europe is uh, experiencing that uh, they can change this balance of power. And uh, the alternative, the possibility and the necessity of an alternative is in changing the relationship of power. Yeah, I would say that the alternatives are not only possible, but they do exist. I mean, we've seen them since the beginning of the crisis. The alternatives are in mo people mobilizing in different squares, uh, in block by, in the new forms of political engagements or new forms of political movements. Uh, on occupation on buildings, self-management. Uh, in Greece, there are a lot of alternatives that have grown up from the local level in uh, cooperative alternatives, ways of uh, finding food or bringing food to other people, exchanges, etc. So I wouldn't say that your alternatives do not exist. Um, and they exist at the European level because these type of movements have existed in different countries, at different levels, and they communicate with each other. They have organized in some ways transnationally. Um, they, the question is whether these forces will ever be able to um, change the balance of power, to, uh, to gain power in Europe. Maybe I want to start directly from what you, you said, Ségolène, changing the balance of power and reflecting also Beppe's intervention. So I want to introduce uh, the question of how do we change these relations of power? What does it mean to acquire power in the context of the European Union? What, what does it mean to acquire power transnationally? And, and maybe uh, uh, the first part of this question, we can look together at the impact of transnational movements, of transnational mobilizations, of transnational uh, activism. I, I would start with you, Daphne, from perhaps the experience of Blockupy, and then uh, those who want to, to intervene, uh, uh, tell me. So how do you read uh, the experience of Blockupy in the context of Germany, and then perhaps from that experience we can broaden out to uh, transnational movements and their, and their heritage? 
I mean, I think Blockupy has been very successful, I would say, in Germany in, in first of all, mobilizing people um, you know, in Frankfurt, most of all, in front of the uh, European Central Bank, which is not a classical city to mobilize 35, 40,000 people. Um, so I think that's a success. And I think at least, I think Blockupy has achieved a moment of disruption. I mean, I think they were quite successful in telling that story that, uh, first of all, it's not, um, you know, first of all, I think we need to send a message from Germany that, it's, that this is not the only opinion <laughs> that, is, that is dominant. And, uh, you know, getting other people to Germany and, you know, form that transnational movement that you need to create these moments, you know, to, to get people together and to mobilize them on the streets if this is the, the, the choice of your, your mobilization. And, um, yeah. But there is uh, this uh, paradoxical role of the Blockupy process, being in the same time uh, the point of view of a minority in Germany, but uh, expressing a social European transnational majority. Second key point is that uh, Blockupy send a, a strong message. We have uh, to build a counter-narrative about the role of uh, European Union institution, about the role of single national government, and particularly the most hegemonic of single national government. We have to build uh, this counter-narrative uh, explaining that there are a lot of alternatives as Ségolène explained before. But this alternative have to take ground in the streets, to take ground in the squares, to express themselves in terms of mass civil disobedience, to produce moments of rapture of the Strassenhorn, of the order in the streets. This is the strong message of Blockupy, that is something uh, producing uh, an uh, echo, resounding, uh, resounding what is happening, uh, what uh, was happened since uh, the beginning uh, of uh, 2010, 2011, uh, all around the squares in the south of Europe, uh, and taking uh, this rage the rage of the squares of South of Europe directly in the center of the financial power in Europe. I want to restart from the, the question of democracy. We've been analyzing in the past years the kidnapping of the political space by financial markets and advocating the need for a return to the political against the primacy of finance and of financial forces. But what the negotiation with Greece seems to show us is that the political has returned but the political appears to be even more regressive than the financial. We are in a situation where financial forces, if anything, are demanding a stabilization of the system, whereas the will to punish Greece is a primarily political will. So is democracy in Europe so much in shreds that we need to go back to the leadership of financial markets because even that leadership is better than the one we have at the moment? Or can we have a realistic imagination for a transformation of democracy in Europe and the construction of a transnational political space in this, in this continent. I, I want to, to ask you that question not from a, a general or, or, or high uh, uh, level, but from the point of view of activism, of NGOs, of civil society, of European movements. What can we do to restart democracy uh, in this continent? Um, I think what we can do is um, to acknowledge, I think, the um, challenge ahead of us and the amount of time it may take. Um, I think that uh, European democracy has always been something uh, problematic. Uh, European politics, as everybody knows, but we can sometimes forget, European politics is hugely problematic. Politics always is. Um, we need to at once um, I would say reinscribe the current situation which appears as a situation of exception into European history uh, to be able to understand it and also, uh, and there's the practical point, um, foster uh, 
repertoires of actions which are successful, methodologies of actions which are successful. I don't think all of those have to be totally invented anew. I think that there's plenty of things in the recent history of Europe about resisting uh, to oppression and overcoming injustice, uh, which we could learn from. Um, and uh, too often, um, the younger generation in particular has a tendency to forget or not want to learn from uh, previous generations' uh, struggles and activities. So I think that's one thing about reinscribing into European history and uh, fostering, sharing uh, successful practices uh, throughout Europe. Um, it's a modest ambition, uh, but one I think ultimately is what builds the foundation for uh, change. Acknowledging, as I said, it's going to take a certain period of time. I think if, um, I mean, democracy clearly is, 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 is the interplay of different opinions and, and, and you know, the kind of well, fighting of, of fighting out uh, a political uh, discourse or, you know, different political traditions, ideologies. And, um, and, if, and if we are looking at, at, at Europe today, I think it, we can also read the, this moment as, as a moment of politicization. So I think from that perspective, or if it is true that it is a moment of politicization, I think it's a good thing for democracy, because then hopefully people do take a stance on you know, the, the issues that, that we are dealing with. And, uh, and kind of reconsider their positions and, and you know, what's their role in it. But at the same time, I think um, it's a danger there that we might end up, or, or that we are already in that situation, that, um, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen, and, and, you know, possibly we end up with this kind of two Europes, that, you know, one side that is kind of the backward looking, that is, that is taking a step back to, to a nationalistic, you know, kind of closed-minded position of Front National or Golden Dawn, and there's the other Europe, you know, that's, that's sitting here maybe at this table and, and, and in our networks, that is, you know, trying to push the, the alternatives, the, the, or the progressive uh, alternatives, and towards a, you know, more hopeful Europe. And uh, and I think our role there is is is, is to to strengthen, obviously, the, or to 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 give an opportunity to those that believe, you know, that they don't want to take that step back to nationalist. Uh, closed-mindedness to say no, there is this alternative, and and you know let's let's you know let's try and be many and and, and you know t be of a hopeful alternative and uh, of a real one. So, in the story of the European integration process, uh, each moment of crisis uh, was the moment fit. Uh, for a jump forward. And I try to reformulate uh, your question. How to deal with this permanent state of emergency in the European governance? In other words, how to deal with a sovereign which is, in the same time, so weak and so ferocious. Having uh, the political production of fear, and this is uh, what mainly we call public opinion. The present public opinion in Europe is the result of a permanent production of social fear. And we have to fight this political production of fear. Using the words of a Blockupy banner, 18th of March, in front of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, it's time that fear change side. This is the core of the democratic issue in this moment, in this present moment in Europe. We need a democratic constituent rupture in the European space. As, as um, the news about the Greek, Greece crisis were, were piling up and were becoming more and more catastrophes last week, I was actually reading a comic book about Ulysses and about Ulysses coming back 
to uh, his island after 20 years of being absent. Um, I got remembered by this comic book that um, actually Ulysses tried not to go away to uh, the war of Troy. He used, uh, he tried to fake mental disease to avoid being sent to, uh, to the war and he was tricked out uh, by the gods um, so he had to go. But uh, in a way, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that uh, the spirit that we, are at, uh, that we have of Ulysses, of adventure, of discovery, of facing difficulties, um, can be born out of a very difficult moment and out of a trick. Um, so there is still the possibility for Europe to go back to uh, inventory spirit, to uh, adventure spirit, um, even if um, now, to Europe and to the left, even, now, even if now the big bad tricks are playing. And of course the Odyssey ends with Ulysses slaughtering all the suitors, but 4,000 years of European history has perhaps taught us a different way to implement radical change. We have to stop our debate here, but I leave you with two people who are working to enact radical change at European level. We are today in Lisbon uh, with Academia Cidada for a transnational training of European activists. I leave you with Joao and Pedro, who tell us a little bit about the situation in Portugal and the relation between Portuguese and Greek activists. The Citizenship Academy uh, started uh, more or less one year after a very big protest that um, some of us uh, organized. Uh, it was actually the, same, the first uh, protest in Europe after the Arab Spring. We had a huge uh, demonstration in the 12th of March uh, 2011 um, with 5% of the population of the country that went out to the streets. Then we organized another another protest and we started realizing that we needed to have some structure uh, in order to uh, be uh, more effective in our activism. Uh, that's how the Citizenship Academy uh, appeared, not only to ourselves, the, the, the guys who organized the, this protest, but uh, also to uh, raise awareness and to train uh, new activists in order for them to be prepared to struggle against what was being and is being um, done with austerity but also to create new alternatives. Yeah, um, after the, the protest one of the things that um, kind of surprised us is that uh, people want that we told what they should do. Uh, and that's not the point. Our point is always we can do it uh, and you can do it by yourself. So uh, that's why for us it's not enough to get out on the street. It's very important, but the idea is to create uh, more active citizens. So to uh, we have this sentence that we quote from our Nobel Prize, Cesar Mago, uh, which is like to make every citizen a politician and that's our goal.